Good morning. My name is Javier Fernandez Han. I'd like to thank all of you for coming to join us today. So today I'm going to talk about why you don't need to be quote unquote uh, creative to be creative. So first of all, where does creativity come from? Two models, the mystery model and the mundane model. In the mystery model, uh, the, the mystery model, uh, out of the blue for the lucky few. Some people are just special. Something about them when they're born is different, and they're very lucky. Every once in a while, they have, or sometimes frequently, they will have a very creative idea, and they're very creative in these certain times. And it seems to be very mysterious. It just happens to them. They happen to be lucky. Something about them is different. And so other people are not like them. These, this is very, very prevalent. You've probably heard people say very often, it just came out of the blue, or it popped into my head. It came fully formed to me in a dream. Here are some examples. First of all, uh, Kukule. He discovered the shape of benzene. Until he figured this out, benzene was thought to be in a linear fashion. But he said that he had this dream. And in this dream, he saw a classical image of Ouroboros. It's a snake eating its own tail. And he realized, he thought, aha, I must be circular. So the, the structure of benzene is not linear. Rather, it's a circle. And he said that this came to him in a dream one day. And maybe he was thinking about this problem, and so he realized, hey, maybe it's, a, maybe it's this shape. So was, but was, that really the, was that really his inspiration? It's not, it doesn't seem like that was really where he got the idea from, because there's another person, Lakshmit. And this person was actually referenced in his, some of his papers. And it's interesting, because if you compare their diagrams, they're very similar. You see, Lakshmit already has the circular shape. And he was even referenced in Kukule's papers. So it seems like maybe he got some inspiration from this. He actually, when he referenced him, I think he was saying he disagreed with something. So maybe it wasn't in a dream. It seems like it wasn't so mysterious. Possibly he was influenced by this. Again, some more diagrams showing clearly that this idea of having a circular structure, which he claimed to him, he claimed came to him in a dream of the, that snake, was already formed. So it's clear that this idea did not come fully formed in a dream, but rather bit by bit. It was probably actually a very slow and strenuous and painful progression to get to this point. It didn't just happen immediately. Here's another example. This person, he is a famous poet. He wrote the poem that's um, the rhyme of the ancient mariner, water, water everywhere, but nor drop to drink. He also wrote something called Kublai Khan. It's also called or a vision in a dream. And he claimed that this poem came to him fully formed in a dream uh, because he was taking some drugs and it just came to him. So he wrote it down and it did really well and people liked it. But as it turns out, if you study his papers, he actually had many different drafts. And these other drafts, in these drafts, some of them portrayed the, way, the things that happened in this in a very different light, it had a completely different feeling. So it didn't come to him fully formed in a dream, he has drafts. Furthermore, it has phrases that are quoted from other, other writers. He took these phrases and put them in there. So it didn't come to him fully formed in a dream. It turns out to be pleasant fiction. Here's another problem. Uh, this is an experiment that someone did. Um, the, the problem, the, the, um, the challenge is to get a candle to stick onto a wall. The, the people that are participating in this experiment, they are given a number of objects. They're given a box full of tacks, a candle, and a wall. And they're supposed to try to figure this out. Um, very commonly, once they finish, once they solve this problem, they will say, the idea popped into my head. I just figured it out, it popped into my head, and I thought of the solution. But if you look at, at what they actually do, it, it doesn't, it, it, it's clear that that's not what's actually happening. So they say they just have this idea, and, and that's the solution that they typically come, come to, uh, to eventually uh, um, find. But if you, one person conducted this experiment, and he, as they were solving this, Ask them every few seconds, what are you thinking about? What did you just think about five or 10 seconds ago? And so then he can create a log of what they thought of. And typically, it was very similar to this. Tack through the candle on the wall. It doesn't work, so they try melting the candle. Uh, once you melt the candle to the wall, it doesn't really stick, so they try something else. And as they're doing this, lots of trial and error, eventually they will empty the tacks from the box. And this is crucial, because once they do this, they don't just see it as a box of tacks. They see this box can be used for something else. They can be used it as a building material. So once they reach this, it takes a bit more trial and error, and eventually they come across the idea of using it 
and pinning, using this box and pinning it to the wall. So this is something that originally people thought just came to them, popped into their mind, but as it turns out, there's a long progression of different thoughts that they went through to get to this. So I've done a kind of study where you look at an insight and you ask them, what did they thought about five or 10 seconds ago? And almost always there's a chain of thought. There's a quote from David Perkins. Ideas that appear novel usually do not come formed as a, just a spurt of genius. They usually come bit by bit in a constantly evolving process. So ideas don't usually come just immediately. Usually it takes progression. Here's another, another activity that, that I have um, participated in. This activity was invented um, a while ago. It's called the Nine Dots Challenge. And it's very commonly referred to as a very good example of someone going out and um, trying to solve this. And once they solve it, they say the idea just pops into their head. So to do this, you arrange the dots in the different lines. You make those nine dots. And you try to connect all of them without removing your writing device from the, from the paper and with straight strokes. And you try to do it in less than four strokes. So when people try to solve this, I've conducted this with a number of groups. And this is what they start doing. People start drawing out these lines. They try different things. When they don't work, they try more things. They start doing some interesting things. Maybe they'll exceed the line. And they keep trying more things, keep trying to you know, just trial and error. Eventually, they'll get to something like this. They're very close. They have three strokes. And they're trying to do this in less than four. They only have two more dots. So a bit more trial and error. And they get to this. They solve it. This is actually where the phrase, the, the term thinking out of the box came from, from this, this experiment. So when you ask people how they solve that, usually they say it pops into the head, but as it turns out, it's a long process. So what seems to come suddenly usually does not. It's part of many, many different mundane processes that they think through to get to this, this common problem. So and these five or, ten step, five or 10 steps that you arrive in an insight and you're surprised and delighted by it, but you forget the five or 10 steps. And that's because when you solve a problem, there's an emotional interest. You think you're very excited. You think, yes, I finally solved it. And you remember that. The other things are not important. So for example, when you drove here today to TEDx, the Woodlands, you probably do not remember all the different stop signs you went through, all the different lights you went through. But hopefully, you'll remember that you came here. And that's what's important. And so if you want to replicate this, you should be able to remember how you got here, too. Same thing with creativity. You have to be able to replicate this by looking at what you're able to do and then finding this insight, but also being able to see those other steps that led to it. So it doesn't mean that ideas out of the blue do not occur. It just means that they are not as frequent as it may seem, and it's not the only way to, have, to be creative. So next, uh, I'm sorry, the, the mystery model. So out of the blue for the lucky few. It's captivating, glamorous, and memorable, but it dimi diminishes, divides, and demotivates. Divides because you say some people are creative and some people are not. Diminishes because it it's downplays the role of common processes of ways to, uh, of creativity, which are a key part of it. It's not just one thing that comes to you. It's a long process. It also demotivates because how can you be more lucky? If you want to be creative and the only way to do it is to be more lucky, what can you do? So next, the mundane model. Mundane, the word mundane usually has negative connotations. When you hear mundane, you usually think of you know, really acceptable or adequate. But the word actually comes from the word mundus, which means the world. And so it's actually, I think it's quite a good word. Because it means that with the mundane model, everyone can create. Everyone can be creative. It's all innate in us. We can all do this. So in the mundane model, it does not rely on luck. Instead, it relies on many, many basic pr uh, processes that we use on a daily basis. Like the straw that broke the back of the camel, these processes, these common processes, when used consistently and very deliberately, can have tremendous effects. So the Monet model does not, rely on, does not rely on luck. Instead, it relies on mindset and mind, knowledge, <coughs> technique, and hard work. So first, I'll talk about the mindset. Studies show that when you think about creativity in this, may, this way, when you seek it, 
and it's encouraged, admired, and practiced, it's greatly enhanced. Here are some other processes that um, kind of attitudes that you should did use when you're being creative. And um, so this is all just a lot of text. Let, let me give you a concrete example now. This is something that I participated in. It's an activity where you have six common objects, and you try to make something artistic, practical, or just interesting. So this is what I created. Uh, and what do you think it is? Have any ideas? Possibly. So actually, this is a, a record player. And I'll explain to you how I thought of this. So I have here my common objects. So when I first had these objects, I was just playing with them. Um, one thing that I like to do is I like to make things that shoot things. It might be kind of a, <laughs> a, kind of a boy thing, I guess. But um, so I started playing around with this. I got my rubber band and my pencil. I thought, hey, I can use this bottle as a sort of a barrel. And I can use this to uh, shoot pencil. Oh, sorry. And so um, I, th I thought I could maybe you know, play with that. Um, I tried some other things. I had some trouble trying to get the, see I can hold the rubber band, but I could not figure out a way to loop it over the bottom. Uh, it was a little bit difficult. So I tried some other things. I got a much larger rubber band, and I tried to loop it around it here. Um, this sort of worked. Um, I also had problems with it. So I, I had the idea of trying to add this paper clip to the end because I was having trouble looping the rubber band over the end of this. It kept falling off. Um, so then I, I was at this stage, um, and I noticed something interesting about it. Because the rubber band pulled on it, it had a bit of a, some tension in it. It had kind of a consistent feeling to it. And when I was just playing around with that, I noticed that when I dragged it across the surface, I could feel the vibrations in the bottle. And so I, then I thought, well, what if I make this more pointed and make it a little bit sharp? And when I dragged it across something, um, I could feel it. I also tried listening to it. And then I thought, hey, it could be a record player. And so this is something that I came up with just lots of very simple processes, simple thoughts, just lots of trial and error. And I got to something that was pretty interesting, I think. It was fun. So here, here's another picture of it. And I have, um, here's another, another idea that I had. So when I film, I like to take videos with my camera. Uh, but often these videos are very, very jittery because when you're holding some, a camera freehand, it's, it's a bit difficult to keep it still. So I had an idea of trying to make sort of a steady cam device. And uh, I was looking for something that could carry a lot of weight and that I could carry with me, possibly on my shoulders. And um, I came across this. It's a stool. And I thought, hey, my head can fit in this. And uh, it's pretty stable. So I can hold it like this, it's very stable, and it even has a counterweight, the chair. And so uh, this is another idea that I had, just being open to things around me and looking for something that would fit my needs. So that, that's a very simple process, just looking for things that can meet the, things, the, the needs that I have and looking around me to, things that, to look for things that can fit my, my needs, basically. Um, so here's some more pictures of it. <laughs> um, a very similar device. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another thing that I made. It's a, a macro lens for my camera. These are usually pretty expensive, so I thought I could maybe make an easier version, a uh, cheaper version, rather. So I had this projector lens. It was in my room. I dis disassembled the projector at one time, and I had this lens. I thought, maybe I can use this. I put it up to my lens, and it seemed to work. So then I thought of a way to attach it to my camera. And I found these, these tubes actually from a, a chair. Because when I <laughs> assembled the chair, I actually forgot to put these rings on it. I wasn't really paying attention. I usually don't use instructions. And so I had these <laughs> nice rings. And I realized that the glass actually fit perfectly in it. And it attached to my camera. So the mundane model. Now I'll talk a bit about technique. So one technique that you can use are heuristics. Heuristics are essentially a hint that leads to discovery. Here's an example. If the whole of something is too complex, try fragmenting it. So heuristics can create variation very quickly. Here are a number of heuristics. I list them quickly. They basically give you different, different hints. And I can now apply them to a pen. So if you look at some of these, let's say I have this pen. I want to apply one of these heuristics. One of them is changing the, um, for example, adding a mirror image. 
creating a mirror image on this. So one way is to maybe make a double-sided pen or make it dynamic, make something bend, change the shape. Or another one is centralized uh, versus distributed. So instead of building them all in one centralized location, send out parts to the consumer and then they can build it their own, there's some self. So these are some examples of ways to apply heuristics. So here, I just showed you a couple of heuristics, there are far more. And let's revisit this nine dot problem and apply some of these heuristics. So let's apply the magnitude heuristic to this problem. We had all those dots, let's apply the magnitude heuristic and make them much larger. Let's also do the same thing for the lines. Suddenly, it's very easy to solve this problem. Because <laughs> you can make these dots very massive and solve it in four, three, two, one, even zero strokes. One way is by, um, and also another way is by uh, applying the heuristics to the paper itself. You can change it by fragmenting it. You can tear it up into pieces, draw the dots, and then make a line. Or you can fold it, have the ink, then um, have the ink bleed through. Um, there's one way that's using origami to fold it to get the dots to all line up. So these are all ways you can use heuristics to solve problems very quickly. It's very deliberate, and it's something that we can all do very easily. So um, here's some other things. For example, you making it dynamic. You use a uh, very wet paintbrush and have the water move so it's dynamic and fills the, the rest of the dots. So the mystery model, out of the blue, for the lucky few. The mundane model, everyone can invent, everyone can be creative. And it's something that's innate. Lots of very basic processes. Looking around, thinking about things that you need, looking for things that can fit your needs. These very simple processes, when used deliberately and together, can have very large effects. And they can be very helpful for creativity. So creativity is something that we can all do. It's inside all of us. And the mundane model, uh, meaning mundus of the world, is creativity for everyone. So creativity. It's, it's creativity that everyone can produce, and it's not mysterious anymore. So thank you. So, Javier. So when Javier told me this story a long time ago, I had no idea that he actually first intended to make, make this into a mortar. <laughs> but what I, found, what I found interesting is you said that you had an intent for a purpose initially, but at some point, you noticed something interesting, this spring tension. I think that's very interesting because it gets back to what Larry was talking about, being observant. Things you had gone in one direction with deliberateness, and then in the course of pursuing that path with earnestness, you were attentive and noticed interesting things, like, hey, what is that all about? You didn't say, oh, well, that's not water. I I throw it away, try something else. You say, hey, yeah. I don't know what this does, but. That's one thing, of when I'm trying to be creative, um, also just in general, if something doesn't work, I, I never see it as a failure. And so when other people say, oh, that failed, or you know, haven't you had a lot of failures or something, it's never even occurred to me. I see it as just another thing to learn from. So when this didn't work, I just looked at the things, the good things that it provided and how it could help me, rather than, oh, it didn't work, I'm going to start over or just give up. So that's, that's a good point. Also, you, know, you mentioned that you made the macro lens um, corridor out of the piece of plastic from our kitchen chair. <laughs> and I'm curious, much of our furniture is disassembled at our house, by the way. <laughs> I'm curious, how were you able to remember that there's this cylindrical plastic thing? How could you call it up when you were doing something completely different with a camera? I mean, there are two different domains, kitchen furniture, camera. How did you link those two? Well, in order to create this macro lens, I had a lens that I wanted to use. I needed a way to attach it. And so I thought of ways that I could attach this, things that would fit around it. And I had remembered disassembling this, or actually uh, failing to assemble it. And so I took this tube. I remembered that it was a similar shape. And I tried it out, and it, it just happened to fit. I remembered it. So it's, it's very important to, I guess, whenever you are during the, during the course of a day, whenever you do anything, just remember what's happening. If you see something that's interesting, maybe take a picture of it, write it down, and that's very helpful for, for creativity as well. So are you saying build up your library of experiences exactly, exactly. To, for future potential extraction yes, for so, use? So it's important to study a wide domain of different things and not just you know, look at anything too, I guess, too much focus without looking at other things. 
could have a wide, wide variety of things to look at mm. and to be uh, part of. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you.